Agree, agree. And Which is hard. It's really hard you. to do. We'll ask you about your feelings about the Philippine national team. What do you think? Uh, what, what are the areas where they could improve? That, one, that one's hard for me because I haven't watched any international basketball in a long time. So that one will be hard for me. Okay. All right. So we got uh, four minutes before we go live. So I'll it's open really it up. It's really cool what you guys are doing too. Yeah. It's it, it was the first time the the first session was the first time so <laughs> a bit we were we had a lot of uh, scrimmages yeah uh, but uh, so I'll start the broadcast now so that they can the attendees can come in I'll put you on spotlight first okay I don't know if if I put you on spotlight video it will be you or the presentation I think it's a presentation still. Yeah, it's it's still the presentation that's uh, the share you screen. You want me to unshare? You want me to unshare? Yeah, to unshare for, first, so you can, so they can see your uh, good looks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> debate. That's debatable right there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was talking to Coach Simon the other day. So yeah. So he's awesome. 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 One of, my, one of my favorite people I've ever worked for. Yeah, I just texted him this morning. He didn't. Uh, he hasn't got back to me yet. Yeah, I almost took your spot there. Almost close, this close. We were two, two of us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We ended yeah, yeah. up uh, getting the other guy. Oh yeah. So, um, well, and he didn't stay long. Yeah, he didn't stay. Yeah. He said just like I sh we should have been, and the Filipino community was ready because I was calling everyone from Germany. Then. Uh, what was that town near? Uh, Hanau. Hanau, Hanau. Oh, near, so Frankfurt. Like, near Frankfurt. Yeah, it's near Frankfurt where there's a, uh, there's a strong Filipino group. So I contact them. Then, you know, I, I might take this job. Yeah. Blah, blah, and they were excited. Oh, it's like 30 minutes from where we are. Yeah, it would be cool to have someone uh, that we know. And then it uh, didn't happen. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well... So yeah, we have uh, attendees coming in right now. So we'll start in a bit. Uh, we welcome you, everyone. Uh, we'll just wait on a couple more. We're on the we're on the thirties now, so should be a, um, the it, the I know it's been tough times, and they just announced that our uh, quarantine period will be extended to another till May fifteenth. I, I think also in the States uh, extended, right? It did extend. And um, for us, college basketball, they canceled all recruiting. They canceled all summer events, which for us, the evaluation period is huge. You know, that's how we are able to, to watch these kids in their AU circuit and, and really sign them. So our, our, our business is hurting right now. Yeah, we'll never know what will happen next. Still, but, you know, we're praying, praying, praying for that cure. And uh, salute to all the frontliners uh, for all your uh, work. So, okay, I guess we can start. We got uh, a lot on the attendees now. Uh, welcome again to the second session of our webinar uh, brought to you by Hoop Coaches International and, of course, sponsored by Blackwater Elite. Again, we're thankful uh, to our two panelists that uh, joined us for, uh, for the session today. Uh, first is Teddy Villasor, a sports psychologist. He's uh, he has a clinic at Makati Med, and he's taking online um, uh, sessions. If you want to contact him, Teddy, can you give us a, a welcome remark? I just want to welcome everybody again. It's um, what what's happening right now with the webinar is is amazing because it keeps us all in touch with each other, and we're always learning. Good. And uh, our next panelist, of course, needs no further introduction. It's the Dean uh, Broadcaster, uh, Kinito Hanson. Sir Kinito, Thanks, good Richard. evening. Thanks. Good evening. And uh, good evening to Dr. Eddie and to Joey. I think it's a great opportunity for 
all of us to get together and interact, especially during these uh, difficult times, um, to have an opportunity to talk basketball, talk about strategies, talk about development, um, certainly a very broadening. And uh, we thank Blackwater and the Hoop Coaches International for making this possible. Thank you, thank you. And uh, of course, special shout out to Boss Giselle Dusi, Siliman C, and to our, our team manager, um, Boss Jacob. Uh, also to Coach Nash, who was, uh, who was uh, in the attendees and he's now uh, also here with us uh, also as uh, attending this. And I'll, I'll put him uh, on the spotlight later. But uh, to introduce our uh, second uh, speaker, so um, um, uh, he's uh, right now is a current uh, assistant coach with the Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, he used where he used to start or almost start his career as a coach. So he, it was like a, a turn, a U turn, complete turnaround from. Uh, and then he last coached with uh, Germany, and he was also with uh, the Spurs Summer League team just recently. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Coach Joey Cantens. Coach Joey, good evening. good evening. Or good morning. Thank you, guys. Good morning for me. Good morning, good morning for, for me, you. But, uh, good evening for. All right. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, during these tough times, everybody quarantined. It's amazing what you guys are doing in the basketball community, but connecting everybody throughout the world. Um, so I appreciate you guys having me and I hope I can provide, even if it's one thing you pick up today, I think it's worth it. So appreciate you guys having me. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of my, of my background, I guess, where I've been before I go on to the, to the actual clinic, just so like, uh, coach Ariel said, I've, I've kind of did a U-turn, but I started at um, Florida State as a graduate assistant, um, which means you're basically going to school and working while you go to school. And from there, I went to Florida Gulf Coast. I was the director of basketball operations. Um, and from there, the last nine years has been crazy. I've worked for eight different coaches, eight different head coaches in the last nine years. Um, I went, so obviously at Florida Gulf Coast, I worked for two coaches. Um, I went to the Dominican Republic. I worked with a pro team in the Dominican Republic, also worked with the national team in the Dominican Republic. Um, I went to University of Southern California. So I was out there and we're playing the Pac-12. From there, I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania is a division two school who actually Mike Taylor, who you have on later played there. Um, from there, I went to Germany. I spent my first year in Germany at Hanau, my second year in Germany at Ludwigsburg who played Champions League and now I came back to Florida Gulf Coast after spending the summer with the uh, Spurs. So it's kind of been crazy. It's been a great experience for me to learn from a bunch of different great coaches. And as a coach now, I can say I have 10 to 12 years of experience. I'm starting to build my own beliefs and my own identity. And I think it's all put together on the other coaches I've worked for and stealing stuff from them, stealing ideas and stealing my own, making my own beliefs from them. So I think as a coach, that's what you have to do. Nobody, invent, nobody invented the game. We're all stealing from each other. So if there's one thing you can steal from me today, I think it's, it's worth it. Um, coach, they have a, the joke in graduate school is, you call that research. Yes, research. I was doing <laughs> research, a lot of basketball research. <laughs> coach, you talked about your history at uh, Florida Gulf uh, Coast. Um, it's like you went full circle. Now, we know of many coaches who've done that. In fact, over in the UAAP, Coach Derek Pomarin of LaSalle, he started off with his team and then he went off to the pros and now he's back with the same uh, college that he started with. Uh, in your situation, in your experience, how did you learn from that? And then could you compare when you went back to uh, Florida Gulf Coast, how was it like knowing that nine years before you had been in the same situation. Had things changed? Um, your loyalty to, to the school was still strong? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I went back. I love the area. Um, I love the administration. I love the people here. And when I came back, a lot of the people in charge and the administration were still in place. Um, so for me, it was an easy decision coming back. The hardest thing I would say coming back is I was here 10 years ago. So when I was here, I was um, maybe not, maybe a little less mature 
Um, my basketball knowledge um, wasn't as high. And really, I've learned so much in the last 10 years. And I felt like a little bit coming back was almost like they viewed me still as the kid when I was 22 years old and not the 33 year old. So I think that was a struggle for me. Um, as a coach, especially, I'm a completely different person. I've grown so much, but also as a person, I've, I've, I've grown so much in the last 10 years. Um, so I'd say that was the only struggle, uh, being viewed in a different light when before I was being, I was viewed as a youngster. Now I'm coming back with more experience and, and not that that necessarily means more respect that you don't, you have to earn your respect, but um, I, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, coach has a presentation to present to all of us. I, if the videos will be lag a bit, we, we, we are more, more than willing to uh, uh, email you the links for the presentation, but uh, take time to uh, jot down your questions and uh, uh, we'll have a question and answer uh, after the presentation. So coach, uh, yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm gonna screen share here, but what I'm gonna try to do is in between each segment, um, take a pause. And if you guys have any specific question towards those drills or, or whatever I just went over, then we can go over it um, then. Is that okay? All right, sounds good, Coach. All right. Let me screen share. Is, did it work? Did the screen share yep. work? Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, Coach Mike went over skill development um, and I came up with this idea. Oh, now my screen's frozen, let's see if I can get it. Hold on, give me a second. All right, here we go. Okay, so I came up with kind of this idea of separating individual skill development and game skill development. Okay, so the obvious skill development, um, what you have, but when you go over skill development and, and you introduce different ways to challenge the player into becoming a better shooter, becoming a better passer or, or ball handler, some of the stuff isn't game realistic. And I came up with this game skill development almost try to help dribbles. That's the most basic, simplest way to, to teach dribbling the ball. Okay, well, when you incorporate tools and different techniques such as tennis ball, resistance band combination moves, I call it overloading the skill. And I think that's when you really start to make jumps and improvements into your game. Okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use this example. I'm going to go over skill development very briefly, just so we can incorporate it into uh, game development. Okay, so the most basic form, form shooting is the most basic thing you can do. You're standing in front of the rim. Um, your focus is obviously on the elbow placement, the wrist placement, his foot balance, his knees, everything, you want everything to be balanced. And you're coaching this as you're coaching this specific skill. Same thing, we're just working on form shooting, talking about the elbow, talking about the follow through. Okay, and this is an example of having a, as a player, being able to differentiate what you use in a game and what you don't use in a game. And as a mature player, this kid specifically understands, hey, I'm never gonna shoot from half court. But when I do a shooting drill from half court, it's to develop wrist strength. It's not to use in a game, I'm trying to, I'm trying to develop wrist strength. So when I do move in back into the three point line, um, the sh my wrist is stronger and it seems closer when you go back, almost playing a mind game with yourself. Okay, and I use the same for Steph Curry. Steph Curry isn't shooting from half court to impress the people on the sideline. Even though it gets a bunch of likes on Twitter and Instagram, he's doing it to develop wrist strength. Now, when he moves back into the three point line, his, it feel, it's almost like you're tricking your mind into thinking you're closer than you really are because you shot from so far. Okay, so that's an example of, of why I separated the two between game development and skill development. All right, 
So now another way to overload the skill. The simple skill is shooting. All right, now we're working on our footwork and shooting. So anytime you come off a curl, anytime you come off a down screen, it's your simple footwork, right, left. And this part of your shot should be exactly the same as form shooting. Perfect balance, feet, knees over your feet, elbow into your follow through. That part should be the exact same as form shooting. And now we're overloading the skill of form shooting by adding a, a, a rotation of the feet. Okay, same thing. Now we're changing his footwork, doing the same thing. It's just, it's just form shooting. Now we're changing the, what his feet are doing. So he's stepping back, shot's the same. It's a form shooting drill. All right, stepping back, form shooting drill. All right, and as a mature, or not a mature player, but I believe players want to know why they're working on something. And as a coach, if you can explain to them, here are the benefits of working on stepping backwards. Here's the, the benefits of working on backpedaling into your shot. Okay, this is one of the most famous shots in NBA history, NBA playoff history. So Ray Allen backpedals, and his footwork is almost going to be exactly the same as what one of our players just worked on. He's stepping backwards and his shot is perfectly balanced because he's done it. So after the game in the interview, he said, I've worked on this shot thousands of times. I knew it was going in. And when you simplify exactly what you're doing, it, he backpedals and it's a form shot. He's done it thousands, 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 thousands of times where he feels confident that that shot's going in. So I think being able to explain to the player why you're doing something and how it translates is a huge advantage to getting them to buy in. All right, now same thing. Basic skill is dribbling the basketball. Most basic way you can introduce it is simple pound dribbles, okay? And, and this right here is what I call overload. When you're able to do pound plus, now you're overloading the drill. So we're overloading the skill of a, of a ball handling drill. It's a simple ball handling drill. And watch his eyes now. His eyes are focused on the tennis ball. Okay, so my explanation of, no, you're never going to use a tennis ball in a game. You're never going to do it. It's not game realistic. But dribbling the ball becomes second nature. And him looking at the tennis ball, now we're able to translate. Okay, it's the same. Imagine you're coming off a ball screen. The dribble part has to be second nature. Now your eyes have to be looking at corners and looking for reads. Okay, and that's what we're trying to simulate when we look at um, including a tennis ball in a drill. Making the pound become second nature and training his eyes to look somewhere else, not at the basketball. Okay, same thing. Now we're adding, again, now we're continuing to add to the drill. Same pound drill. Now we're adding a cross and we still have the tennis ball. All right, here's another example of, of compounding the drill. Same pounds, we're just adding resistance. And again, I really like to explain to the kids why, why are you working on this? Okay, it's off season, it's summertime. Um, you only have one person, you can't go live. Well, this exact dribble you're gonna use in a game, except it's gonna be a body leaning on you. Okay, so if you can imagine the resistance band as a defender, and you're having to be explosive and explode out of the move, it helps translate why I'm doing this into a real life game situation. All right, same, we're just adding combination moves. It's a simple pound drill, just adding combinations. Same pound combination, plus now we're on the move. So all we're doing is overloading the skill of a pound dribble. It's a pound dribble plus a combination plus you're on the move. All right. And everybody loves doing what NBA players do. Again, Steph Curry's never going to do this in a game. He's never going to take 18 dribbles between, between, behind, behind. But he, in the way I see it, I see him as overloading the skill. It's a ball handling drill, but it's between, between, behind, behind, where now when he has to make one move, it's simple because he's done it 15 times. All right. I'm going to unshare for a second.
Okay, so I just wanted to I just wanted to give a brief, uh, I guess, idea of how I view skill development, and from there I'm going to take it into why it's important to game development. Um, so if, I don't know if you want to talk about anything, if anybody has anything, or if you want to continue right on. We have uh, two questions, Coach. Yep. Um, the first one is, uh, I'm coaching elementary players. What is the difference with coaching elementary players to that of professionals, uh, professional players? Um, I think when you talk about skill development, um, you have to understand the level you're at. And what I mean by that is I showed first in, in every skill, whether it was dribbling or shooting, I showed the most basic thing you can do. Form shooting is the most basic thing you can do. When the elementary player masters the form shooting, now you can add something. Now you can start to overload the skill of form shooting. Same with ball handling. The most basic thing skill you have to have first is a pound dribble. Once the elementary kid can master the pound dribble, now you can add a cross into a pound. Now you can add uh, movement into a pound. So, and Mike talked about this is, is really investing in your players. Um, when you get to know their game and get to know their level and get to know what they can and can't do, I think it makes it easier to simplify the game and say, okay, we're slowly overloading this skill. Coach, how long are your sessions? Um, it depends. Um, when we're in season, I try to go shorter. I try to go 30 minutes and do a lot of repetition. Um, during the off season, I try to go an hour and more up tempo, more high speed, more um, less less reps and more high speed um, contact and, and make it more physical and get them more tired. Coach, are you doing this exclusively for your varsity team or are you also doing this for other age groups or levels of, uh, of development? Um, in, in NCAA, I'm actually not allowed to work with the youth. I can only work with our players. So on our roster, we only have 13 players. I can only work with them. And that's an NCAA rule that I have to follow. Okay. So I have worked with kids. Um, I obviously have worked with pros, college kids. Um, and again, I think if you simplify it to this almost like easy thinking. It's pound, it's three simple skills and you continue to overload those skills. I think it allows you to work with any level really. We have a question from uh, Chase. Uh, in terms of player development, how do you get guys into the gym? Do you recruit uh, high character gym rats? Yeah, uh, we try to. And um, actually before the webinar started, um, we talked about the NCA is limiting recruiting right now because of coronavirus. So it's harder and harder right now to actually know who you're signing. Um, of course, every high school coach and everybody that works with them wants to tell you that they're the greatest thing ever and they're the hardest worker and they're the bed. They'll do whatever you say. They, they, they love being in the gym and you don't really know what you have, I'd say, until about a month after having them. Um, so I think a lot of it depends on the kid. Um, like the clips I'm showing of that individual kid working, he's bought into the process. He believes in um, the process of getting better and he believes that I'm bought into him. So I think a lot of it has to be trust on both sides that, okay, coach is here to help me and I'm here to help you. Um, but if I, I also do believe if you don't have it in you, it's hard to drag kids in the gym. Coach, your, your, the drills that you, uh, that you teach, um, is, is there a difference when you're teaching big guys, small guys? Do you do the same drills for it, regardless of their height or position? Um, the basics, like some of the drills we did, I want to do with everybody. I think okay. to be a complete basketball player, you have to be able to pass, dribble, shoot. Um, so those basic stuff I'll do with everybody. And now when we go into game development, I'll separate players. So guards, you need to be able to have this specific skill that maybe the bigs don't need to have. But the basics, everybody needs to have. Everybody needs to be able to pass, dribble, shoot. Coach Joey, we have a question from Coach Louis Gonzalez. Coach Louis asking, when does individual skill development happen and game skill development, when does that happen? I think, 
and, and I'm about to go over the, the process of it, but I think it has to coexist together. Um, for us right now, it's the off season. Um, obviously we're not together, but right now is the time where you do the most skill development. Right now you have the most time. Right now you can, you can get in the gym and get 500 reps of one simple passing drill um, because the team's not together, especially now in quarantine, you know, you're working on a certain pass Well, you can throw it off the wall a thousand times. You don't have your team to work on game development in these times right now. Um, but when we get to preseason and we're introducing concepts, offensive concepts of what we want to run this year, um, spacing, then it's more important to work on game development more so than individual development that you should have done all summer. Coach, where do you get the most gratification? You've coached in the pro level. You've coached uh, with a national team. You're coaching a college team. Where do you get the most gratification? Um, I've actually discovered this about myself. Uh, basketball is basketball. Well, no matter what level, no matter where you are in the world, um, the goal is to win. The goal is to have a group that comes together and enjoy each other. Um, I'd say at every level I've been at where I get the most gratification, and it's, it's funny because I'm doing development stuff now, but when you see a kid or a player do something in a game that they couldn't do a month ago, and they look to the bench and they're, they're coach. <laughs> and when they do that in a game, to me, that's where I get the most gratification. And, and, and honestly, I've, I've had that exact feeling, whether it was working with pros um, or whether it was working with kids. So just learning where I am myself, it's about, and that's why I love the skill development and the game development part of basketball, because to me, obviously winning, number one, everybody wants to win. But when a kid looks to the bench and he's like, coach, we did it. There's nothing more gratifying than that moment. Coach, you have another question. Uh, this is from jo uh, Jojo. And he, and he asks, um, do you change a player's shooting form from what he or she is accustomed to? Or do you leave it as is? I'm, I will only mess with their balance. So I'll, I, I try not to touch um, the way they hold it. If they hold it here, 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 I try not to mess with that. What I do tweak is their balance with their feet, their balance with their hips, and their follow through. I want the follow through to be straight. But as far as this, um, especially in college, because I'm getting them when they're probably 18 already, they've taken so many shots, so there's certain form. I try not to change the form, but I do try to improve the balance. Thanks, Coach. Yep. All right, I'm gonna go back to screen share. Is the screen share back? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, and this is why I did the skill development. Um, when you're, when you start stacking development, I think is when you really see progress in a player. Okay. So everything that we just saw in skill development was in an easy setting. So what does an easy setting mean? It means one on O. It means you're throwing a, a pass against the wall. Um, you have a coach working on you one on one and, and giving you specific skills that you have to work on. Okay. Now we're talking about controlled settings. All right, will be step number two. What's a controlled setting? Now you're adding in spacing. You're adding in a certain read that a player has to make. Okay. Then we're then the last part of it is a live setting. So in the live setting, I want the player to make the read on his own. And if you're able to master one, two, three, hopefully you you're able to do it in a game. Okay. Um, the reason I have this outline, I would say, is players have to build confidence. You can't tell them, Hey, I want you to make this play. I, I want you to be the best pick and roll passer in the league. Okay. Well, what's the plan? If you don't give players a plan of development, it's hard for them to imagine, okay, I'm going to be the best pick and roll passer in the league. So you build confidence by being able to pass in an easy setting one on zero. I made that pass a thousand times coach. I know I can make that pass. Okay. Now you're introducing reads. You have them do it over and over and over. You get reps at it in practice. Coach, I feel confident in that. Now they're doing it on their own in a, in a live four-on-four, three-on-three three setting. And from there, they're able to, with confidence, take it into a game. All right, so let's go on a specific skill. All right, this specific skill we call, it's over the head hook, but you're throwing it in a, ball, in a wing ball screen setting. Okay, so 
the best players in the world, and I, I really believe this, the best players in the world don't get bored with step one. If you can get rep after rep after rep and your 150th rep is just as good as your first rep, um, you're, you, you have a chance to be a really good player. Okay, so basic skill, throw an over the head hook and we're gonna incorporate this into a wing ball screen here in a minute. Okay, so now we're stacking skills. All right, again, this is my favorite sign. We're adding to what we just did. So now we're imagining it's a ball screen. We're coming off the ball screen. He's literally throwing the same exact pass he just threw a thousand times stationary. Now we're adding, for, we're trying to get him to understand you use this on a wing ball screen. Same setup. He's imagining wing ball screen. And now he's throwing that hook pass that he already did hundreds of times stationary. All right. So that all that stuff, and, and, and I just answered this question, but that's all stuff we want to do in the summer. We want to do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we want guys to throw a hook pass against the wall. Okay. Now we start introducing team concepts, spacing, um, reads, and this is what I call a controlled environment. This is still easy because there's no defense, but this is a controlled environment. Okay, so wing ball screen, he should be lower in the corner. We want to work on a setup. We want to wait on the ball screen. And in this specific drill, we're working on your read is throwing to the shake. All right, shake is going to be this guy coming up out of the corner. So he threw the over the head hook pass. You can also throw it with two hands, but right now we, we established the skill. Now we're working on the read. So now we put in a three on O, we show what a wing ball screen is. And we're working on that simple skill of throwing the, the, um, the shake pass. All right, so again, here's the easy setting. Stationary, which we watched. On the move, now we're building three on O. Okay, so those are all easy settings. You build confidence knowing, okay, I've done it hundreds of times in an easy setting. From there, we go to a controlled setting. Okay, so now what's, the, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't add this, but we're going, we're now adding off a, a wing ball screen, the roll, okay? So obviously on any wing ball screen, there's a guy in the corner at ball screen. Your reads are gonna be the shake pass to here, which we just threw, or the roll. Okay, how do you control a setting? So I'm as a coach in this drill. My, my terminology for this is give them, give them clear and obvious reads. Okay, so in this pass, it's clear and obvious that I take the big man so he has layup. Good, he's setting up. Again, it's clear and obvious that I take the ball handler so he has the roll man. All right, and our teaching point on this is throw it Throw it, throw it up or throw it down. Throw a bounce pass, don't throw a chest pass. Good, same setup. Clear and obvious read, I help up on the ball handler, he has the roll man. Good, clear. And, and the reason I like clear and obvious reads, especially when you first implement something, is it helps the players build confidence in it. It helps the players know, okay, I, I read it right. Now when it gets more game-like, they feel like they've already done it over and over and over. Okay, now we add all three pieces. In this specific drill, I, I told the guys to throw the shake pass. But when we throw the shake pass, what's the next step? Now we're working on, okay, I didn't have shot. I'm throwing into the post. So now we're building off that wing ball screen. So your read is throw it to the shake. All right, so our ball handler is working on over the head hook pass. We're throwing it into the post. So these are all controlled settings because I'm, I'm, I'm dictating where they want to, where I want the ball to go. All right, now we're incorporating again, five, five man spacing. So you have to understand there's a guy in the corner. There's a guy on the wing. When I come off this ball screen, I can't come too far. There's a guy there. There's also a guy in the corner. 
but I'm still making them make a read. I, if I'm guarding the corner guy and I help in, it's a clear and obvious read to the corner. He makes a good read, needs to be a better pass, but I'm still controlling what the players are seeing. Good, so I stay on the corner, the roll man's open. I come in to help, he hits the corner. Okay, so, so these are all different examples of, of controlled settings, which we just watched. Um, again, I, I think it helps build confidence. I think it helps the players when, when you take all the other defenders and you make them only make one read, it makes it easier for them, it builds confidence. Later, you can start adding two defenders, adding three defenders, and now they're having to read a second layer of defense, a third layer of defense, okay? From there, when they finally understand the reads, now I want them to play live. Um, when we go live, I like giving the defense freedom um, to guard it how you want to guard it. So now, as an offensive player, it's a surprise. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what the coverage is going to be, all right? So the last layer of development is being able to read the defense all right, we talked about spacing. Now it's reading defense. What did they give you? Wing ball screen. Good. He throws over the head hook pass. This defender is in, guarding the roll man. He makes the right read to the shake. Okay. Here's one of my favorite plays right here. And he picks up with two hands, which we didn't talk about that specific skill, but that's another skill. He picks up with two hands. Watch this defender right here. He picks up with two hands and takes a quick fake to the corner guy. So when he makes that ball fake to the corner, this defender leaves and it opens up the roll man. So it's a two hand pickup. He fakes to the corner. He hits that roll man by, by using his eyes to get that corner defender out. Same. Okay, so this is the exact drill we worked on, three on O. Um, we hit the shake. I don't like the pass because he threw it with his right hand. So now he's throwing through traffic. I, I would prefer a left hand hook pass there. Um, but we worked on this drill. You don't have an angle to pass it. He has to dribble down. Okay. And the million dollar question as a coach is how do I get my players to, to take something we worked on from a game and in practice, sorry, something we worked on in practice and have it translate to a game. Um, I think the answer is it's never going to be 100%. Get, basketball is a game of mistakes. But by breaking down simple things, this player has to know how to get it to this guy. We worked on that already. All right. And watching film will help develop these players to understand he has to take one dribble down and then post feed him. Okay, so... This ball handler does a great job reading the defense. Now he sees a different coverage. This guy jumps way out. So watch this situation. We have one guy. We have a two on one situation. We have to score in there. We have to. All right, he does a good job hitting the shake and the shake guy knows it's going right in. Okay, and so what we just saw was live setting. You can set it up three on three. You can set it up four on four. Um, now we want to make it competitive. And as a coach, I think this is the best time to evaluate, are the players understanding what we're teaching them? Were they able, were they able to take what we did one on O, two on O, three on O, the simple reads and incorporate it into a live setting? Um, if you feel they were able to, to, to master the easy setting, the controlled setting and the live setting, from there, they should have the confidence to take it to a game. And here's some clips. And we run this offense, um, simple wing ball screen with space offense. I feel like we did a good job um, incorporating what we did in drills and, and having it transfer to games. Our guys understood the reads. Okay, I put this clip because he throws. Now this kid believes in the process and, and really works on every specific skill.
That's a really hard pass to make, but he's thrown it thousands and thousands of times that he feels confident even throwing an over-the-head hook pass, which I, I probably wouldn't teach most, especially youth kids, to throw. But he's done it so many times, he feels confident throwing that even to the roll man. Good setup on the ball screen. All right, and he has that two-hand pickup. And watch this defender right here. That's simple eye fake. Two-hand pickup, simple eye fake. This guy leaves, and it opens up the roll man. Good. Now they're understanding the reads. They understand who's open if the guy tagged. I put this clip in just because this is the same kid. Um, he really got better at work. He works on this pass every day. This is a pick and pop situation. Look how much quicker this pass is just because he never has to pick it up with two hands. He's able to go right off the bounce and throw that over the head hook pass and hits him right in stride for a perfect shot. Same here. Is that a ball screen? Is that a read? No, he's just done it so many times in an easy setting. He sees there's a guy open in the corner, fastest way to get it to him. Off the balance, he throws a hook pass. Um, that, that, that's a really high level play. And it just shows it's not when, when, when you do it in an easy setting, he built so much confidence in it. He's now taken it to other aspects of the game, not only a wing ball screen. All right. Um, and this is what I've been talking about. The process builds confidence. Um, you can't just tell a player, hey, you shot 30% from three last year. Next year, we want to shoot 40. Okay, coach, well, that sounds great, but what's the plan? How are we going to get there? What, what are we going to do? Um, and I think building confidence, especially talking about shooting, we build confidence right at the rim with form shooting. You see the ball go in. Um, now we add in footwork. Now we add in different pickup points. Um, and if there's any terminology that I'm, I'm throwing, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm throwing basketball talk, but if there's anything um, you guys aren't sure about, ask. Um, but when we start um, adding over overloading the drill of shooting and to go throwing in range shooting. Now you're coming back in. I think it gives a player a, a more confident approach to working on his game as a, as opposed to just saying, Hey, next year we're going to shoot 40%. Okay. Well, well, how coach? Okay. I'm going to take this Push off on. share if we have any questions and we'll come Push back. To Coach Joey, we have a question from coach John Uchiko. Yep. Uh, when, when does the roller roll? Is the ball handler always on attack mode or does he hesitate to read the on the ball we, defense? We teach, so the, the roller has to stay until the guard uses the screen, okay? Um, I don't like to set hard rules because as the big man, if you see the defender jumps out at a hard hedge, then you're allowed to slip, but only if he jumps out in a hard hedge. So I don't always like putting specific rules on you have to do this because I believe you have to learn how to read the game. If the defender jumps all the way out to half court, hey, we don't want you to stay. We want you to slip. Um, but if the guard does use the screen, you have to wait until he uses it until he gets past you. And as a guard, we teach our guards to almost take a pause dribble and read what the defense is doing. Thanks, Coach. Coach, uh, you, the, your whole presentation was – built on trying to instill a high level of confidence in your players, um, using the form drills, using the other things that you were talking about. As a coach, what would you suggest in terms of still getting to that goal of building confidence off the court? What can you do to build a player's confidence off the court outside uh, of those drills that you talked about? So we, we do, um, we watch a lot of film, um, especially post game. I try to send um, clips individually to all of our players and I, I clip them. I actually use my phone now. I just record it right on the phone and I send them a strand of their individual clips. Um, and I think that does a lot of things, but I think it shows number one, you're invested in them. Um, you care about what they're doing. You care about their development. And when a coach cares about it, I think it, it helps them invest more. Um, so number one is film. I think that that helps so much for them to see themselves playing. Um, but number two, I think is just knowing as a player, knowing that somebody is there to help you, knowing that somebody cares about your game, knowing that somebody cares about your development. Mm -hmm. 
I'm gonna, um, it, whenever we're done with questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, now I'm gonna go through the whole process of why we work on something, um, if we're ready now. Please continue, Coach. All right, so now I'm gonna go through the whole process of baseline drive. Okay, so maybe if it goes. Give it a second to load, I'm sorry. Give me a second, sorry, it froze for a second. Okay, so uh, this could be after a game, okay? I'm trying to decide what drills I wanna work on in practice, or it could be postseason. I'm saying, okay, what did our team do well? What did our team not do well? Okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to develop uh, a plan for our team to get better as a group and as individuals. Okay, so in this specific clip, we have a baseline drive. Okay, we have one guy open. We have two guys open. We have three guys open. And he shoots a pretty bad shot. Okay, so what does that tell me as a coach? That tells me that we don't know the reads when we make a baseline drive. Okay, so we need to, we need to set up drills. We need to work on this because our guys aren't clear what we're looking for when we drive baseline. <clears throat> Okay, again, we're breaking it down to the simplest form. We're, we're, we're building confidence in an easy setting. We're going rep after rep. We're, we're throwing that baseline um, one hand pass because that's, that's what our spacing should be, okay? We'll get a bunch of this also. We're also throwing to the 45 man. All right, baseline drive. So after he gets a bunch of reps in, in the simplest form, throwing to the baseline, throwing to the guy at the 45, He's starting to understand where players are supposed to be. He's starting to understand how I get it to the corner guy. Okay, well, now we're implementing it in a, in a team setting. Okay, so our teaching points on a baseline drive, we should have a guy in the corner. If there's a big, so he started opposite block, he should be circling to the front of the rim. That's an outlet. He gets corner. That's an outlet. Uh, whoever's up here should be getting 45. Okay. And here's one of my biggest teaching points. There's no way he can pass it to number 15 because you're in the direct line. So again, I don't like putting specific rules on, hey, get to the 45 because you have to play basketball. You have to read the game. In this situation, he should probably come here where he actually has a passing angle to him. And now he'd have, he has one angle, he has two angles, he has three outlets of passes he can make. Okay, so we're breaking this down in the easiest um, form we can, introducing now spacing, introducing where the other players are on the floor. And it's a continuous drill. We have baseline drive, big circles to the front of the rim. Again, we obviously didn't do a good job teaching this. This is the second guy in a row that's in the same line as the big. He needs to come to here. And now the big is also getting reps. He's circling in front of the rim and he's getting a ball from the coach. Now we, okay, now we're starting to control what the reads are, okay? So this is one of our managers right here. He's guarding the, the big man. Every time in this drill, he's stepping up to the ball and we're gonna hit the, we're gonna hit the big that circles to the front of the rim. So now in, an, in a very easy setting on the same drill where it was just four on O, he's starting to learn reads. He's starting to learn that if the five man's defender helps up, he has the five man on a dump off and same rules, throw it up or throw it down. And we're just getting reps. We're getting, we're, we're doing this over and over and over where they build confidence that they know I have the big man circling to the front of the rim 
I have somebody going corner and I have somebody going to the 45. All right, now we're adding layers to the drill, okay? So same drill, he's gonna start on offense. You can't see me behind somebody. We already saw this read, he's gonna help over. Now they're reading a second layer of defense. All right, so I'm in the drill here. He has to read, am I cracking down on the big? Am I staying here? Am I staying with a 45 guy? Good, so he makes the right read. I take away the baseline, baseline's not open. The big circle into the front of the rim is open. Okay, now this time I take away the big circle into the front of the rim. Now he has baseline pass. So he does a good job adjusting um, and reading it in a very controlled setting. Good, same read. I take away the big circling, he finds the drift in the corner. Good, now he hits 45. Okay, so here he had two reads. He has corner and he has the big man in front of the rim. I take away 45 guy. Okay, so we start, we keep on stacking our, um, our skills. So first you, own, first you did it four on O. Then you do it having to read one defender. Then you do it having to read two defenders. Um, and being able to, to, to let it layer like that, I think will help give you a bigger picture of what's happening in a five on five setting. Okay, I just put this clip on here because on this specific clip, we're working on our five on O motion. Okay, and this is awesome. We're just working on our spacing. We get a baseline drive. So we're not even working on baseline drives, but I love this clip because baseline drive, big circle in the front of the rim. He's getting 45. These guys are even, but or sorry, he's getting to the baseline. One of these guys should be getting to 45. And I think this clip shows that we, we did a pretty decent job of telling the players or showing the players what spots they should be in and when to get there on a baseline drive. We weren't even working on baseline drives. We were just working on a motion. They're able to get there. Okay, so now we take it to a live situation. Baseline drive, good read. It's the corner. And the corner three to the corner. Harper, baseline drive. Corner three for Warren is good. Addo kicks it out. Cashmere. Go on the drive, finds Casimir. So good job. This guy stays with the corner man, so corner's not open. He somehow gets that to the 45 guy. I think he makes a good read on this where nobody comes and helps. He gets by the big, he stays on that line to the corner. He's, this defender stays at 45 and he finishes. Okay, I'm gonna stop share for a, a minute and then we could come back to reading screens if we have time. Um, so I, 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 I'm hoping that kind of gives a, a clear view of when I say game development, it's still skill development. The simple skill of that shake pass, throwing the over the head hook pass, and then you start to build in onto it and showing the players, explaining the players the spacing, uh, the defensive coverage, um, learning to read the help side. When you put all that together is, is what helps build a game product and, and what helps give the players an understanding of where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, and what the reads are going to be. Okay. Coach Joey, we have a couple of questions from, from the audience. Uh, the first one is uh, from Angelica. She's asking, how will you handle a player who thinks he knows it all? Um, I, I think you're always going to run into players like that. Um, and, and, and I think it's okay, especially when you're working with higher level players. They study the game too. Um, and like I said earlier, I, I've worked for so many coaches that 
I don't believe there's one way to do stuff. I believe there's multiple way to do things and you, and you could do the same exact thing and teach it a different way. Um, so I'm actually okay with debate. And, and for me, it's different because I'm not a head coach and I'm not demanding, no, do it this way. Um, so I'm okay with debate, but if you're going to debate with me on how to do something, you need to show me evidence. Um, don't just say, Hey, this pass is better. Well, show me why. If you think it's quicker and, and, and I may, I may be able to adapt and adjust. If you think it's quicker and I really believe, and you can show me and prove to me why it's quicker. Okay. I'm up for it. I like, I, I like that, um, conversation with players. Now, if you're just saying, Hey, I'm not doing that. Well, now, now you have an issue with the head coach. Cause that's what he's asking you to do. Coach, what about sharing responsibilities within the coaching staff? Do you have like a defensive coach, an offensive coach? And how is that coordination um, made possible? Yeah, uh, this year, um, and we did it different than most staffs I've been on. Um, I think every staff does it their own way. But the way we did it this year was we basically had an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, and then I ran all our skill development. Um, obviously, everybody's everybody touches everything, you know, we're all in it together, but I like doing it that way because as an assistant, when, when the head coach says, Hey, you're responsible for this specific part of the game, this specific part of development and, and this specific um, during timeouts, you, you're only worried about the defense. You're only worried about reads. I like it that way because it creates buy-in in every single drill and every single practice and every single game, everybody's locked in and engaged because they all have a responsibility. As opposed to, I've been places also where, hey, this is, I do all, the head coach does most of it. Hey, this is your scout. So you're locked in for that game. And then the next game, maybe it's the other assistant scout and you don't feel as engaged. You don't feel almost as, uh, you, I mean, you didn't, you clearly, you, you just didn't do as much work because you didn't watch all the film as the other assistant. So I like the way we did it this year because everybody's engaged for every practice and every game. Coach, as a follow-up to Arkinita's question, uh, I asked you earlier before we started, uh, as a coach with more than 11 years of experience, uh, what can you give us five qualities that a basketball coach should possess in order to be successful? Yep. Uh, number one, I think you have to be trustworthy, um, especially in the aspect I'm, I'm dealing with our players with trying to develop their game and, and get them to grow and get them to become better players. If they don't believe and trust what I'm doing and we don't have trust in each other, it, we're, we're all wasting our time. So they have to trust what I'm doing. Um, number two, you have to be demanding. Okay. You can't, you can't introduce a skill or introduce a certain thing you want them to do and they don't do it right and demand they do it wrong. If, if you're not demanding on that player and you let them get away with stuff, they're never going to be the best version of themselves. Um, number three, you have to be compassionate. Uh, at the end of the day, they're people also. Yeah, we have a common goal to win. We have a common goal to get better, but they're people. And it, it's almost the same as being, uh, it, well, it correlates to being trustworthy. If you don't care about them, they're not going to want to work with you. They're not going to want to listen to you. You have to be compassionate. You have to really care about them. Um, I think you have to be organized. Um, I'll steal this. I, 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 I stole this from Simon Cody. I worked with him in Germany, but when we practice planned, I, I'm not exaggerating. We would spend seven hours preparing a hour and a half practice and taking that organization. I learned from him and implementing it to what I do now has helped me organize a drill. Okay. What's, what's the goal for today? We want to work on three on two reads. Well, with my organization and knowing what we did last week, or the week before it helps me build on what we did last week. It helps me build to be able to get to five on five, when we're ready on November 10th, okay, I feel confident that I was organized in, in setting our players up to be, have the best chance to be successful um, possible. Coach, um, um, Clarence is asking a question. What software, what application are you using to break down game tapes? Uh, we use, uh, it's called XOS. Um, it, it's, it's okay. Um, I don't love it. My favorite one is Sports Code. I've used that one before. Um, but our system we use right now, that's what I'm actually on right now is XOS. There's a question from one of our assistant coach, Gilbert Lau. Uh, what particular aspect of the game are you looking for and when, well, are you looking for when scouting an opponent? What particular aspect are you 
looking for? Um, I try to I try to find for more themes. Um, at the end of the day, basketball it's a simple game. People are trying to get into a middle ball screen and create an advantage of the ball screen. Um, but if you can find a theme where they have different actions, but it all gets into a say we'll use a middle ball screen. Okay, they they do a weave into a middle ball screen, or they do a dribble handoff back screen into a middle ball screen. Um, I think if players understand the themes and the big concepts that the opponent is, is trying to execute on offense, I think that's more productive than saying, Hey, here's, here's their horn side. I mean, some of our players don't even know all of our plays and we're expecting them to know 20 of the other of the opponent's plays. Um, so for me, I'm big on themes and, big picture stuff when it comes to scouting more so than individual plays when I'm not confident our plays, our players know all of our plays. Coach, you have a question from Mark. Is, is reading the, the game of basketball, one needs to have great basketball IQ. How would you handle players with poor knowledge on basketball, but very, but they are still very passionate about it? Yeah, I, I go back to watching film. Um, and, and I think everybody right now in this time is kind of finding ways to be creative and, and um, get their players engaged and involved. Um, one thing I'm doing a lot right now is for each individual player, what their game is, what their role is with our team, finding NBA players that are like them and sending them film. Um, sending them, uh, and, and some of the clips we pull now, I'll send to our guys about pick and roll reads. Well, I want all our point guards seeing it because we're not able to do it in a team environment right now. And I think the more you see it and the more film you watch, um, it helps you create a better understanding of what the defense is doing. What's the purpose of the play? What's the purpose of the offense? And then going back to the question earlier, when you have that understanding, now we can debate. Now we can debate about what's the best way to do it. What did you see another team do? From um, Mark, we, we have a question. With so many quote-unquote Instagram trainers nowadays, what's your take on the use of on the use of using a bunch of tools to enhance training? For instance, um, picking up cones to simulate drop uh, the dropping of the shoulder. I don't love it, and here's why. I, and all of us have seen uh, players that look unbelievable against a chair unbelievable against a cone they, they they look like all stars and you put them in a live environment and it doesn't translate so and, and that's why i'm big on explaining to players yeah it's a tennis ball i know you're never going to use it in a game but when i use tools i try to make sure it, it there's a translation to the game i don't just use 15 cones and say pick up here drop there pick up this one throw this one throw this one at me throw this one here i try to use tools that help me simulate the game um and, and i'm able to explain it i want to be able to explain it to the player why you're doing this not go around the chair 10 times throw this pass backwards and throw this cone over your head <laughs> but but that's where that's where the game's going and everybody likes instagram and everybody everybody wants to get ten thousand likes and coach we have we have a question from mike uh, mike's asking you mentioned that players need to learn how to read the defense. How about coaches reading the game? What do you look into first during game time? Um, so I think it begins even before that. Okay. So, so we're like, when we're preparing our offensive game plan, um, we already know how the opponent guards ball screens. Okay. So we'll use the wing ball screen. We watch when they hard hedge, for the three days before the game, we're already teaching our players in a three-on-three -three situation. In a hard hedge, this is what we're looking for, okay? And as a coach, if you do a good job teaching what we're going to do, that means you're beating it, okay? Well, it's a chess game. That means the opponent's coach is going to say, well, we have to make an adjustment, okay? Well, when they stop their hard hedge and they start sagging, that's when I think really good coaches – um, or when you, you can see who a really good coach is. When they change their pick and roll coverage, number one, how quick are you able to, to see it? Do you call timeout right after and, and, and say, okay, guys, here's our adjustment. 
They're no longer hard hedging. They're sagging. Here's what we're going to do. Um, so I think the hardest, the hardest thing for a coach to see is in-game adjustments. And I think if you can see those and have a plan beforehand, um, that's what makes you a really good coach. I have a, I have a personal question. Yep. Uh, during your, you had, during your time with San, with the San Antonio Spurs, um, people who, people who have worked with San Antonio, the question that's usually asked them is, do you have a pop story that you can share with us? Um, you know, I, w when you think of San Antonio, San Antonio Spurs, everybody always talks about culture. Um, you know, you, you read an article and they talk about culture and, and, and culture this, culture that. And it's kind of, for me, it was always hard to imagine what that really means. Like, yeah, okay, everybody's a good guy, but how do you get everybody to, be, to buy in? How do you get everybody to be a good guy? How do you get everybody to care about each other? Um, and one of the things they did, which I thought was unbelievable, and to witness it firsthand really, like, opened my eyes to, it's real. What they talk about culture, it's real. So every night they do dinner, okay? So sometimes it was just the players. Sometimes it was the players and the staff. And sometimes it was player, staff, and front office. But every night it was a combination of, of some group of people. Um, one of the coolest things I saw, we go to dinner, and there's a lady that works in the, I believe it was the finance office. And she walks in, and one of the players uh, didn't know who she was. And the conversation was, hold on, you two don't know each other? Okay, well, you two, we're getting you a table for two. Um, you guys get to know each other, have conversation. Um, the rest of the group is eating together. So you literally took a player that, that say he's a, whatever, he's, he's a million dollar player, whoever, it doesn't matter who he is. And he's sitting with somebody from the finance department asking questions about how's your family, where are you from? And, and that experience for me was so genuine of, well, why do they care? about each other later? Well, because they invest the time in each other earlier. They get to know each other and, and build real relationships. But related to that question, uh, uh, what about your experience with the Dominican Republic national team? Um, a situation where you had a lot of stars, Charlie Villanueva was playing for that uh, team and Carl Anthony Towns, you had a chance to work with him too, especially during the 2014 FIBA World Cup. Um, not too much practice time together, not too much um, opportunities to interact with the players. Then you had a head coach, John Calipari, at that time. So how were you able to put all your valuable basketball knowledge to play given such a controlled situation? Yeah. Um, he's one of the best I've ever seen at getting everybody to buy in. Um, from day one, um, we actually had a guy that played in the NBA who, who ended up coming off the bench and Calipari ended up starting a kid that was in junior college in the U S um, and everybody was okay with it. Cause this is what's best for the team. And in a normal situation, and, and maybe it was pride for the country and, and pride for we're going to do whatever it takes, but he did an unbelievable job as a coach creating buy-in to, we all have one common goal. Um, and going back to um, how everybody kind of, I would say, figured out the systems. Um, when, when you're talking that caliber player, they're so smart. They're so smart. You, 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 you tell them one time what you want the pick and roll coverage to be, and they got it. They can be running down the court. You don't even have to call timeout. You can, you can change pick and roll coverage in transition. And that was the first time I've really seen something that high level working with them. And it was unbelievable. And, and that's why I say when I love when players watch film and have an opinion on how to do stuff because you can you're the one having to do it as a coach this is what this is a suggestion we think this is the best way of watching the film but if if you don't think you can do it well tell me you have to tell me what you think you can do and now i can hold you accountable okay uh a follow up to that uh what's the difference between coaching in europe and going back to the states uh the athletes the culture uh what was that experience uh, well, college, first of all, limits how many hours you can work with them. Um, so going back to the national team, we have to be efficient in college. Um, we have to practice plan. We have to make sure we're getting the most out of the time. We're only allowed 20 hours a week to work with our players. Um, so a lot of it, 
a lot of it, we, we do less with our players in college, um, which I don't like, but we also have to, we get kids at 18 years old, 18 to 22, um, working in Europe pros, when they go home, they have their own life. They have their own family. Um, it's almost more like a job, a business. Yeah. I'm here to help you and help you develop as a player, but you have your life. I have my life. Um, in college, everybody's on campus. So not only are you helping them develop as basketball players, but you're helping them develop as people. They're figuring, they're figuring out who they are. They're figuring out what they like, what they don't like. Um, one of the hardest things for a freshman is figuring out when I have to do my homework. You're not just here to play basketball. You actually have to do homework. You have to study. You have to take tests. And kids going over there for the first time and the first time they're away from home really struggle with time management and – being able to say, okay, I'm a basketball player and I'm a student with all this freedom. Nobody telling me what to do. Nobody telling me when to be here. It's for, for a lot of kids, it's the first time in their life being free. Uh, Coach, do you have, uh, do you have uh, more presentation or we go to the, we finish the um, Whatever you question. want. I have one more. I have one uh, more. On uh, go on and then we finish with the question and answer because there's a ton of questions. So maybe uh, finish your presentation first. Give it a second so it loads. All right. While it loads, there's a question. Speaking of game time adjustment, how do you know if your game game plan is working on the early part of the game? as it is simple as just the lead or you observe a certain flow of the game, if, if it works or not, it's from uh, Coach Clarence. Uh, I mean, most important, you got to win the game. So I don't care what you do. If you have more points, that's good. Uh -huh. um, but no, I think, I think you have to have a feel for, I mean, if you, if you get 10 easy points in transition and didn't have to run offense and it's 10-0, you're, you're not able to tell yet if your game plan worked. Um, so I do think you have to have a feel for, okay, in this specific situation, I keep going back to wing ball screen. That's what we watch. In this specific wing ball screen, did they guard it how we prepared? All right, are our guys prepared for what we worked on the last three days? Um, I, I don't know that you could put a number on it, but if you feel we, had, we were 0 for 3 on a certain uh, play, uh, don't go back to it. <laughs> it didn't work. Or it's time to make an adjustment. Um, but I don't know that you could put a specific number on it. Maybe one of your players just made a bad pass and threw it out of bounds. Do you take uh, do you take notes or assistants? Do you ask uh, are the assistants asked by the head coach to like jot how many plays work or? Uh, yeah, we, do you have we, that? we do track it. Um, we we track it. So every time we run a play, um, we mark it. So we just mark it as a tally. If we score on it, we circle. So when we go to halftime, we have a good understanding of what plays we think worked, what we scored on, what plays we ran and didn't score on. So when we go to halftime, we have a good game plan as far as, okay, these three or four plays were really efficient against them. We scored six out of eight, eight times, or we ran this play four times. We didn't score on it. We thought it was going to be good this game and it wasn't. So I, yeah, we we I think we try to do a good job at halftime adjusting for the second half. We try to get this running. Here we go. Should go here. There we go. All right. All right. So again, everybody in the world does this. This is, this is a very easy setting. We're coming off a, a screen and we're shooting. Okay. And in this case, it's a curl. So the basic teaching point is your, your defender was trailing. He got caught on the screen. Okay. So now we're just getting reps. 
Okay, we're doing it one on O now. Same drill, now the teaching point is, you have to imagine the defender went under. If the defender goes under, you're popping back on the screen. Very easy way to teach reading screens. So at first we're just telling this, we're, we're making them get reps with that footwork. We're making them step back behind the screen. Okay, now we're including a defender, okay? So this is a controlled setting. Here's one of our managers. He knows exactly what he's doing every time. So in this specific drill, he's trailing, okay? So player, as it, your read when somebody's trailing is you're curling, all right? You're curling, you're going for a layup. So now in a controlled setting, we're getting a lot of reps reading the curl, all right? We, as coaches, this is all set up. We plan for this uh, the day before or in the morning, okay? So we worked on if he goes over the screen. Let's say he goes under the screen. We already worked on with a cone. Now we're putting it into game situation. Defender goes under the screen. You should be stopping behind the screen. Now we're getting reps stopping behind the screen and actually reading it in a controlled situation. Okay, he goes under. And again, this is a, this is a set. We, we did this, we planned for this before practice. Now it's two on two. Again, with a coach and a manager. Same, he goes under, he should stop behind. All right, this is a scenario that happens a bunch in the games where the big and the guard defender don't know who should take him because he's open. They both go running at him. He has to see that the big is open on a slip. Okay, so we're setting up these, these environments. We're setting up these reads beforehand before we even expect them to be able to do it in a game. Okay, now we put it in a live setting. So it's a simple two on two setting. And right now is the first time we get to evaluate as coaches, are they understanding what we're teaching them? Are they able to take the drills we worked on and read when you should stop behind, when you should curl? If, if we don't think they're understanding, then we need to go back to square one and do it again in an easy setting. It's a great read right there. Defender goes under, he stops behind. So it looks like still in a practice controlled setting, they're starting to understand it. Great setup. So now, now we have guys that are starting to understand how to play off screens. Good, he goes under on that flare. He stops behind, shoots it. Good, he gets stuck going over. Does a good job creating space. Great setup. Watch this player's change of pace. He, do, he does an unbelievable job. We ran this for him all year. Just simple floppy action down screens. But he made this play successful. Great read. He's trailing. Great read on the curl. He has shot. I'll, um, I'll stop it right there unless we have more time. But I, I just wanted everybody to be able to see how we get to, I'm watching film. Our team needs to get better at this. This certain player needs to get better at this. Putting them in, a, in an easy environment, in a controlled environment, into a live environment before we expect them to put it in a, be able to do it in a game environment. Oh, I can't hear you. You're on mute, Ariel, there you go. There you go, okay. How big part does analytics play in your program for skill and team development? And what specific analytics does you focus on? Or at least three areas that you focus on? Um, we use analytics and, and, and I'll consider what I just talked about with um, the efficiency of plays. We want to know what plays worked, what plays didn't work. Um, so that's most importantly for the staff. Um, one big thing that we use analytics for is uh, almost to, to back up what we're saying, almost as proof. So if I'm trying to convince one of our players, hey, a, a pull-up jump shot isn't a good shot for you. You're not, you don't make that at a high rate. Um, we try to back everything we say up with numbers. I'm not just saying this uh, to say you're not a good player. This is what the numbers say. Um, and again, it goes back to, as a player, you want to have debate with me about what's the best way to do stuff. When I present something to you, 
uh, development wise that you don't, you shouldn't do this. This isn't good for you as a player. And this isn't good for our team. I'm going to back it up with numbers. So I'd say we use analytics um, mostly for that, mostly to, to show our players why we want you to do this or why we don't want you to do this. All right, this coach, you talked about reading uh, the game. Uh, what's the best way to improve basketball knowledge and how to make good adjustments in the game? That's from I, Coach uh, Budi, uh, all the way from Indonesia. I think I think you just have to have um, it's in-game experience, and I've been lucky working with I work with the Dominican national team for three years. I think over a summer span, including scrimmages and and and, and um, friendly games. We played 50 games each summer. Um, so, so, so you're able to have more live experience doing it and, and having to do it under a pressure situation. Um, when I was in Germany, my last year, we played Champions League. We made it to the final four of Champions League. I think we played 80 games. Um, whereas in college, you, you, you only have 30 games. You're only allowed 30 games by schedule. So for me, my development, I'd say in coach um, experience, what a college coach gets in one year, I got in one year, I got basically three years of college um, in, in a sense of doing 50 games over summer and doing 80 games um, with the German team. So I think it's all about in live, live in game experience. And the more you do it under pressure situations, the better you're going to become at it. Uh, during a top ball screen situation, where do you want to send the ball handler? Are you going to rely on tendencies or you send it uh, on uh, which way? Uh, we've uh, done different, we've, we've had different strategies. If there's a player that we think really struggles going to his weak hand, we will send it weak. Um, there's other players we've, we've scouted where when he comes off the top ball screen, he's going to score. And if we feel it's more of a scoring threat, we'll sag the big and, and make him play two on one at the rim. Um, so I think it depends more on the scout of who our opponent is. If he's, if he's not good going as we can, we're sending it weak. If he's looking to score, we're going to sag and make him play two on one at the rim. Uh, do you guys uh, press? If yes, why? And when do you use the press defense? That's from uh, coach Wayne. We, we tried to this year. Um, that was in the plans in the preseason. Um, and I think going back, this all, it, it's funny, it all ties back together, but I think being a good coach, you have to evaluate your players and see what they're able and not able to do. So our plan in the preseason, we were going to be a pressing team. We wanted to press 75% of the possessions. Well, we got into practice and our two five men had no chance in a pressing system. So we backed off of it this year. Um, and we, we'd used it some out of a timeout or out of certain situations, dead ball, where we can get set. Um, but our initial plan was to be a pressing system. And when we tried it with our guys, they weren't capable, our bigs weren't capable of, of playing in a pressing system. So again, I think that's part of being a good coach. Okay, I want to do this, but is my ego too big to say, you know, that's what I want to do, but that's not what's best for our players. I have to back off of this and, and, and find something else we can do. Who was uh, uh, your biggest interest or you like your mentor uh, from all the coaches that you've been under with? I know it's Coach Simon, Coach yeah, Alipari, you know, Coach. I've been, I've been lucky. I've, I've, and, and, and a lot of this business is being lucky, um, putting yourself in, in positions um, that hopefully help you. But I've been lucky to work with a lot of great coaches that have won a lot. Um, and, and really, I still watch – I'll watch Kentucky games because I'm a fan of how they do stuff. I watch Ludwigsburg's game because I'm a fan of how they do stuff. I watch Simon Cody's games because I'm a fan of how they do. I still watch all these teams because I, I, I've taken something from their program and, and taken it with me. Um, I'm going to share this story of, of, of how I got involved in the Dominican national team just because this business is so hard. And again, it's about who you know and who your connections are sometimes more so than what you know and, and, and how you can help a basketball team. Um, 
But when I, when I got involved with the Dominican national team, I called one of the assistants that was working with them and said, hey, can I come watch practice? Um, so my initial intent was to go there, watch practice for, I think it was four or five days. And I had to go back to work. I, I couldn't take all this time off. So the second day there, they said the gym was empty and I'm in the gym waiting for practice to start and say, hey, can you help me rebound? Yeah, I'll help. I, I got you. I'll help you rebound. Okay. Hey, can you help me with this drill? Yeah, I'll help you with the drill. Hey, oh, you have a car? Can you pick this kid up from the airport? Yeah, no problem. I'll pick him up from the airport. Um, and then at that point, they found out I spoke Spanish. Um, so next thing I know, we're four days in. I'm following Calipari around on the court, um, being his translator. So he's speaking in English. I'm translating for him uh, to, this, to the players that don't speak English. And I showed up there to watch practice. I showed up there to learn. I showed up there for, for professional development. Um, so now it's time for me to leave. I'm going back to work. And they're kind of like, where are you going? So I, mean, I, have, a, I have a job. I have, to, I, have to, uh, I have to go back to work. And they asked me to stay. I asked my boss. And, and, and I ended up working with them for three years. But the reason I share that story is, and sometimes you're not able to, sometimes it's hard. But as a young coach or somebody trying to get in the business, you have to invest in yourself. Um, and in that specific situation, I invested in an opportunity to learn. And I ended, I ended up learning for three years some of the, the, the highest level basketball I've ever been around. So um, obviously I got lucky, but it was a blessing. But as a coach, you have to put yourself in situations where um, you never know what can happen. What about the players whom you worked with um, during your time with the Dominican national team? Earlier, we talked about Charlie Villanueva. Uh, we talked about Carl Anthony Towns. What about Al Horford? He must have been quite a guy to work with. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was one of the most professional um, players I've ever been around as far as their approach to the game, uh, the way he took care of his body, um, the way he treated people, the way he talked to people. So to see him not only be the hardest worker already as an NBA all-star. He's the hardest worker. He's the first one in the gym. Um, he's the last one leaving because he feels he needs to take care of his body and go through his stretching routine and get his treatment. And then when you leave the gym, seeing the way he interacts with people and treats people, he was just an awesome individual to be around more so than a player. He was an awesome person. What about the rule changes? You have FIBA, there's college rules, there's the NBA rules. Um, how have you been able to adjust going from yeah, one thing to another? It's funny you say that. And, and a lot of it is, is being around. Uh, I do, when I changed from college to international and I went to NBA, yeah. I spent some time reading the rule books now. I, I had to make <laughs> sure, but I'll never forget my first day in, uh, in San Antonio. We're doing a drill and they're talking about 2.9. I've never heard that term in my life. 2.9, what's 2.9? And, and, and I think that's, that's how you grow as a coach and that's how you expand. Well, 2.9, obviously there's a, an offense, uh, sorry, a defensive three second in the, um, mm -hmm. in the NBA. Okay, well, 2.9 is basically like their trigger that you have to get out, touch outside the paint, then you can get back in. I never heard that term in my life. I'm at an NBA practice and I'm like, 2.9. And it's not, it, it was for no other reason than I hadn't been exposed to that yet. So I think that's, again, that's another example of growing as a player and uh, sorry, as a coach. And I wasn't ashamed of it. Listen, I've never been in an NBA practice. I didn't know what 2.9 was. These are different rules. When you were with the Spurs, did you ever come across um, Chip Engeland? Um, yes. He's very well known in Philippine basketball. Yeah. He played in the Philippines. He's got a heart that's full of his Philippine experiences. Yeah. yeah. What can he, you tell us about Chip? Um, well, he wasn't around so much because it was just a summer league team. Um, but he would come around for dinner and watch practices. Um, but just a very engaging person. And again, it goes back to the culture. Um, he walks in the first day I was there and introduced himself, had a full conversation with me. He doesn't even know who I am. Yeah, but this is an <laughs> NBA assistant. I mean, he doesn't even have to speak to me and just treated me like I was one of them. So that, that was, he's a perfect example of what that culture really is. Thanks to know. Uh, we got uh, 10 more minutes on uh, time for question and answer, RJ. Yeah, but there's another question. What do you more focus on developing weakness of a player or his strengths? Um, I think it's both. Um, I think you have to continue to, to 
improve your strengths because that's what's made you successful to this point. Um, you, you, if, if you already do something well, well, let's keep, let's do it at a higher level. Now, if there's something limiting you and um, I think to, to make a jump in your game and you have to be able to make a floater and you don't make floaters right now, um, we're, we're going to work on it. So I, I think it's a balance of both. Obviously don't, don't lose what you do. Well, keep working on that. There's, there's a reason you, you're, you're good at what you do, but in order to make jumps, um, especially over summer, um, what's your goal for the summer? What do you have to improve? What do you have to get better at? Continue doing what you're good at, but I think you have to slowly incorporate things you're not good at. Uh, there's another one on uh, ball reversals. How how do you run your ball screen? Do you still uh, step up your man, or do you do you do a quick dribble handoff on the re ball reversals on a ball reversal um for us it was based on personnel um so if we had say a four man on the wing that we didn't want using ball screens we would make him dribble handoff to the guard in the corner so it would be a dribble handoff and then the guard in the corner would come off the ball screen um if it was reversed and the guy that caught the ball was a guard and the person in the corner was a, a somebody we didn't want using ball screen. We would just have him wait until the until the ball screen got there. So for us, we established rules of who's allowed to use ball screens, who's not allowed to use ball screens, more so than dribble handoff or wait for the ball screen. All right, all right. So yeah, uh, for some parting words, coach. And um, I know you're uh, for the presentation. Uh, for those who want a copy, you you. You have your email information that you can yep. share. I'll, um, or yeah. Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen right now, uh, so that way everybody can get my email. There's my email and my phone number. Um, if you want to shoot me a message or or go through email. Uh, so program uh, allow uh, coaches to visit. Yes, for sure. We're, we're, we're open. Um, we love people coming around. Um, we love sharing ideas. Um, we love trying new stuff. We're open to trying anything and building connections. Um, so don't be afraid to, to send me a message, whether it's on email or text, but uh, I love connecting with new people and, and sharing ideas. One quick last question, if I may, um, Coach. Um, we know about your coaching experiences now. What about your playing experience? You played three years for Eckerd uh, University or Eckerd College. Yep. Yep. Um, and there is one PBA player named Jay Washington who also played for that school. Um, what did you learn as a player and what did you bring from that experience um, into your coaching career? Uh, I, I learned that I need to retire quickly as a player and become <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I loved playing. Um, I really enjoyed my experience as a player because obviously I, I grew up as a kid. My dad coached um, basketball. I grew up a kid playing basketball, played in high school, played in college. Um, I actually, I tore my ACL, had knee surgery. I had one more year to play and just said, I'm, I'm, I'm done. My body hurts too much. Not that I would have ever had a chance to play for money, but um, I loved it. Um, built great relationships. Um, I still, I still get out now with our scout team and practice with our team. Um, so I, I love playing. I'll play pickup. But I don't know. I, when I got done playing, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I've been lucky ever since. I've walked into good coaching situations. But, yeah, I, I, whether you played or didn't play, I don't think it affects if you're a good coach or not. For me, I, for me playing is something I did for fun and something I still do for fun. I love it. All right, so that wraps it up for uh, Coach uh, Joey. Joey, Coach Joey would like to thank you in behalf of the uh, Filipinos and the Southeast Asians that are tuned in and uh, attended the clinic. Uh, I'd like to thank you for spending your, uh, your time with us in this uh, uh, situation or in this uh, new situation for us all. all. Uh, we'd learn uh, a lot and uh, uh, you have your contact information and thank you for sharing this to the attendees. Um, again, uh, we uh, stay, stay in touch in uh, regards to the family and uh, keep safe. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Joey.
for the attendees, we'll have uh, another session uh, with uh, Coach Bill Baino. That's happening on uh, 9.30. So that's a 15-minute break for all of us. Uh, but make sure you um, click again or, or refresh your screen. You have to, um, uh, to enroll again or to register again so that uh, we'll be able to count, uh, count how many. And uh, we'll announce a few winners of the uh, for the giveaway from uh, Blackwater. And uh, thanks again, uh, the Dean and the Dean and Doc. So uh, <laughs> I have you now, uh, the combination, Dean and Doc. Thank you very much. And uh, to the attendees, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>